Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. This is Michael Kupfer with Harvard Business Services, and I'm joined by Brett Nelson and Jared Nelson, and they're going to be bringing us through today's presentation on Series LLCs. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we begin. Uh, first and foremost, we are using some new audio equipment today. So um, if you're listening and we are crackling or too loud or too soft or anything like that, please jump in the chat and let us know, and we will do our best to fix it as promptly as possible. Uh, but hopefully this will be a better experience than the audio in our past webinars. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, as always, we are going to be doing a Q&A. Uh, at the end of our session. So um, I do encourage you, while Jared and Brett are speaking, go ahead and chat in any questions that you have, and uh, we'll either answer them you know, during this conversation or we'll hold them to the end and uh, make sure everybody gets an answer to their question, uh, either during the webinar or, or we can follow up afterwards if we need to. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, we're going to be going about one hour here. Uh, I do see a couple comments coming in that there's an echo, so I will work on that in just one moment. Thank you for that feedback. And uh, just a couple of quick things about Harvard Business Services. Uh, who we are, if you're not familiar, uh, we're a company that was founded in 1981 in Wilmington, Delaware by Rick Bell. Um, we're still a family owned and operating, uh, owned and operated company. Uh, we're completely private. Uh, we have formed over 225,000 companies. We have over 100,000 clients worldwide. Uh, we are Delaware registered agents and formation specialists. Um, if you've read any reviews of our company, you'll know that we are very customer focused. We put a high value on supporting uh, and, and satisfying every single customer that we work with. It is important to note that we're not attorneys or accountants, uh, so the information you'll get today is not uh, legal advice or accounting advice, so please don't take it as such. And finally, we are not affiliated in any way with Harvard University. Uh, just the same name, same uh, name of Harvard, but no other relation whatsoever to them. And this will bring us to our agenda today. And for this, I'm going to turn things over to Jared, and he can talk you through this and, and get us started on today's conversation. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're discussing the Series LLC. Uh, it's not a new entity, per se. It was first adopted uh, in 1996 by Delaware, an early adopter of the form, but it was recently amended. Um, and those amendments are what we're primarily going to focus on today. In summary, the Series LLC was a form that simply was not used prior to the 2019 amendments. And you'll see why in a moment. The amendments, however, dealt with a number of the issues that kept the series LLC from really gaining prominence. At the same time, however, the fixes that Delaware came up with may have undermined the very purpose of the series LLC uh, at the outset, which was cost and ease of administration. So what is a series LLC? A series LLC is a single LLC that is comprised of any number of separate series, or what I like to think of as, as cells in a honeycomb, each of which are treated for most but not all purposes as separate legal entities. And that's important to remember. For most purposes, they are separate legal entities in the sense of corporate personhood, in the sense of limitation of liability. Uh, in the sense of the ability to sue and, and own property uh, in its own name, but it is not a separate legal entity. The concept of the series LLC uh, came from overseas, from segregated portfolio companies that were used offshore, oftentimes in the Cayman Islands. These were used quite often by investment funds or insurance companies, captive insurance companies, uh, and then also by mutual funds to operate uh, a number of passive investment funds out of a single entity. Now, in Delaware, what were series LLCs used for in the past? In our experience, this is Brett Melson, um, Vice President of Sales. We've seen a lot of clients that have interest in forming LLCs, and primarily one of the reasons that it brings them to us and they inquire about it is for the cost savings. Um, the ability 
in the past to simply have one LLC and then each internal series or class is handled internally within the LLC's agreement, potentially saving from having to form a separate LLC for each aspect of the business. However, the banks, um, other states, uh, they're just accountants, attorneys, many just weren't familiar with this structure. It created a lot of hiccups, a lot of confusion, and it just simply didn't work. I agree, Brett. I think there's, you know, there's been many times in, in, in my past work with the series LLC and private practice where it often took I and the client a lot longer to explain to bankers, accountants, service providers, even potential investors, sort of what the series LLC is and how it works. That time spent sort of overwhelmed the time and the cost saved and the purported ease of administration of, of having one LLC with multiple series. And the issue really stemmed from the fact that when the series LLC is filed, a certificate of formation is submitted to Delaware. And then internally, these each individual series or classes were kept on file within the, the series LLC agreement. So there was nowhere, nowhere for the banks to really see that, hey, here's this individual series on file and registered with the state. And that's where most of the confusion stemmed from. And what we're going to be discussing quite a bit here is the recent amendments that Delaware um, enacted that allowed for the each individual series uh, within the LLC itself to be filed and on record with the state. You know, that lock, lack of documentation is a very good point. It, it, it raised a number of issues. Uh, you know, it, it raised issues around service providers. Um, it raised concerns and trying to get lending from banks because you as you said you couldn't literally show someone a certificate that, that legally formed the series it was really just a book entry um, on the llc's books and records so there were also uh, there were also other uh, a few other factors that prevented the series llc's widespread use um, because it wasn't a registered entity that had its own um, registration and certificate that, that evidenced its legal existence there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of questions about whether a creditor could perfect a security interest in a series in series assets under the UCC uh, because it was not it didn't satisfy certain definitions. There simply weren't ways to attach certain property to put a lien on an office building of a series, for instance. Um, and there was a lot of question around that. There was also a lot of question around whether a single series could declare bankruptcy while still not then pulling the entire LLC into bankruptcy. Again, there was a lack of judicial testing, as Brett mentioned. There, there still has not been judicial testing of the internal liability shields uh, between the series, even in Delaware. And there are certainly concerns over the recognition of separate series in jurisdictions without any form of series entities. I believe there are 16 states uh, and two, I think, principalities, Puerto Rico and, and maybe another that have series entities. So while it's growing, there's a lot of jurisdictions where the very concept might not be recognized. Now, what is the essence of a series LLC? What does it do with these cells? Series LLCs permit the segregation of assets and liabilities into series. So for instance, you could have three series. None of the series are able to have a claim over the assets of the LLC as a whole or another series. Similarly, none of the series or the LLC as a whole can claim any of the assets of the original series we were discussing um, as their own. So each series is treated like a separate liability shielded entity. So more or less to summarize, each series is almost like an individual LLC itself. However, it, it is just handled in the past within the internal operating agreement within the entity. That's and right. we're going to be discussing as we move forward the new structure of this registered series and, and the benefit that it has to um, clients looking to go this way. Definitely, definitely. You know, I think, um, you know, as you've discussed, the general benefits of the series LLC, um, cost, the lack of separate fees, uh, administration, uh, these are things which which certainly do have a place, but um, you know the, the creation of the registered series really made the series much more like independent entities, and really did 
leave one with the question of whether there there is still a, a reason for the series LLC uh, to exist besides the simple fact that it's interesting from a legal perspective. Uh, so in regards to the LLC, the, the new series LLC, there are individual filings made with Delaware Division of Corporations to actually go ahead and register each one of the individual series. And that's what hampered clients in the past. It sounded so fantastic in theory. Oh, we can go ahead and have one LLC with a slew of independent internal series. And that's really going to go ahead and save me so much money. So if you're a gentleman or if you're an investor, perhaps, that has 12 different real estate properties, the, the cost savings on the annual franchise tax to Delaware, the formation fees um, seem to appear quite outstanding. But then when you look, for instance, at the counterparties to purchasing these assets, you know, again, you run into the issue of are they going to recognize a series as an entity? Do they feel comfortable doing business with a series and not the entity as a whole? And if that's not the case, then it undermines the entire sort of reason for existence of the series LLC. I mean, as we said, the series LLC can hold, the series individually can hold assets in their name. They can incur liabilities. They can sue and be sued. Each series can have its own members, separate members from other series, and its own management. And its own EIN that other series. That's right, its own EIN. And th now the IRS has come out and said that a series of a series LLC will be generally separately treated as a partnership uh, or a corporation or disregarded entity, depending upon how the series uh, checks the box, as they say in IRS parlance. So it's a distinct entity for tax purposes. Now, with the states, however, it's a little less clear. For instance, Texas was often a state where the series LLC was disfavored, and the entire LLC would be wrapped up and treated as a whole, regardless of the different series. And that certainly undermined a, a lot of the efficiency and a lot of the uh, ease across different jurisdictions uh, that the series LLCs faced. And, and that was a fear that a lot of different attorneys and clients had when using the structure, not only with Texas, but California, the other states um, involved as well. Um, That's very true. And, and, and because these, the novel nature of these series, you know, the, the judges in these areas simply don't understand them. I mean, it's oftentimes, you know, outside of Delaware, where you're not using the Chancery Court, the specialized business court of equity, um, you're not sure what sort of judge you're going to get. You don't know his or her business sophistication. Uh, the series LLC is a difficult concept, and oftentimes one might get a judge in a state without a series concept, and who knows what the, will happen to the liability shields. Uh, I think the series LLC easily could have been killed off in its infancy by a few negative rulings uh, in a number of courts that, that really hammered down those internal walls and, and removed the entire reason for the, LLC's, the series LLC's existence. So what would you say would have been the primary driving force for clients to use the series LLC up until some of these recent developments of the registered series being allowed? You know, in my former practice, um, I used the LLC, Series LLC a number of times, usually only grudgingly. Um, I used it, for instance, at one point to create a venture capital investing platform for cannabis companies, cannabis companies that, that both, quote, touched the plant and did not touch the plant, uh, meaning they sold a cannabis or didn't sell cannabis. Um, each series would represent a single investment by a group of people in a different cannabis company. Now the the gentleman, uh, the founder was uh, was running on a, a, on a shoestring, and he knew that there would be at least a hundred uh, investments quite quickly. And so, rather than have a hundred separate LLCs, he became enamored with the notion of the series within a series LLC. You know, he would have the series named Series Roman Numeral. 57, and then it would have a doing business as name that generally referenced the investment underneath. By the end, I think we had something like 80 to 100 um, separate series of a series LLC, and then they were all simply demarcated on the books and records of the LLC as a whole, the, the overarching LLC. And a lot of investors and a lot of even the companies that, that uh, my client was investing in became very leery of that 
of that situation. You know, these were relatively small venture capital investments, anywhere from fifty thousand to three hundred thousand. But you know, still the the sort of legal sort of Damocles was there hanging over the entire organization structure. Um, so again, I've only used it grudgingly. The times I've seen it most used are simply in the very simple example, much like what you get the example you gave, Brett, where someone might hold three pieces of property in a three series LLC, or they might hold a car, a boat, and a plane, simply to hold their assets within one entity, but within different series. And then that the thought there is why risk it? Why not just go ahead and simply form a separate LLC if you're dealing with a large asset? It's been proven time and time and time again. But yeah, every once in a while, you have someone who becomes enamored with this type of structure. And in the past, it just really hasn't worked. So um, that's just some of the features of the series as a whole. Um, and this is going to allow us to go ahead and get into the, the actual registered series aspect, which is, which is pretty exciting, the concept of it. If I could, Brett, I think I might go into, if you don't mind, the operating agreement first, just to say, so, for instance, how do you draft a document that governs the rights and obligations of the members of the different series, um, the powers of management of each series, uh, the governance obligations, and the different, simply the different arrangements governing a series rather than the whole LLC? Because remember, as we discussed, each series can have its own management terms, its own management entity, its structure, rights and obligations. What I've always done in this context, and again, this is my approach and that of some others, is to use a, a master LLC agreement first. Uh, so the overarching LLC will have an LLC operating agreement, which sets out those terms that are common to all of the series. Separately, each series then has a short term sheet, a series supplement that sets out the terms that vary from those in the master LLC, LLC agreement or which supplement the master LLC agreement. So for instance, if the LLC agreement says that any lawsuit must be brought to arbitration before going to a court, another series could simply say that it can grow, go immediately to the courts of the state of Delaware. Um, one might provide for a certain compensation to its management entity, a mother might, another might not. Um, so there's a lot of ways that um, this sort of plug-and-play agreement works well. It ends up being a fairly fulsome master LLC agreement with one or two-page supplements that simply vary those terms that are necessary for a specific series. Now, the members of a given series would sign the series supplement and they would also agree to be bound as if they were a signatory to the master LLC operating agreement. As a member of a series, they are not actually a member of the full LLC. So I would have them bound, uh, much like a third party beneficiary to the master LLC agreement, but uh, they would actually sign the, the series supplement, which governs the series specific terms. And this is one thing that I find so interesting that the LLC is so popular in general, the regular LLC, due to the freedom of contract, the flexibility that the LLC agreement provides, and this series LLC agreement, and what you just mentioned here um, in regards to the series operating agreement, really demonstrates that unique flexibility that the LLC has, not just a series LLC. Interesting. Thank you, Jim. Certainly, Brent, certainly. I know I think you had led us into what I feel is the most interesting ground, um, which is the protected versus the registered series. So essentially, how did Delaware breathe possible new life into the series LLC? Well, it amended the provisions that that really held the series LLC back. So what we previously knew as series, things that were simply demarcated on the books and records of the LLC, there were no filings, there were no fees, there were no taxes. Those became what we refer to as protected series. So the protected series are the traditional informally created series that exist only on the records of the series LLC. Secondly, we had registered series, a newly created type of series. A registered series requires a certificate of registered series to form it separate from the formation document of the LLC. 
Um, it files amendments as needed to that certificate of registered series. At the end of its term or at the end of its life, it has to fire a, file a certificate of cancellation of that certificate of registered series. And it has to pay uh, a state annual tax, uh, much like a franchise tax, but uh, I don't believe they refer to it as such. And this all became effective August 1st, 2019. Now, each one of these documents that you mentioned about each protected or each registered series, the amendments, those are all documents filed with Delaware Division of Corporations, which is unique from pre-August of 2019. Since the filings are actually on record, recorded with Delaware, um, that's what's really brought this forward and, and really, in a lot of people's eyes, gone ahead and made it a more widely used entity. I think you're right. I think it, um, you know, the registered series concept really has a lot of potential. Um, as you can see uh, on the quick reference sheet we have here, protected versus registered series. This gives you a nice breakdown of, you know, everything from the cost, the naming conventions, the documents necessary, um, other states' recognition. And you can see that the protected series are much more informal. The registered series require more, like you talked about, filing filings with the state of Delaware. Uh, or the registered series name must begin with the primary LLC name, but need not include the word series. You also have to perform a name check. For a registered series to make sure it is distinguishable from other companies and other series in Delaware. And we can do that for you in a matter of seconds if mm -hmm. you're looking to file the LLC. Definitely. It's a stand entity in the certificates, the annual taxation, whereas the protected series, as it was before, still just really remains a um, a fence post series of assets that has only book entries to demarcate from other assets of the LLC. And this addition to the series, the registered series, this is really what the financial institutions want to see. This is what everyone wants to see, to be able to prove that it's actually on the book somewhere, not just within the LLC agreement that you mentioned. Now, when we go ahead and compare, you know, we've got the protected series LLC. We've got the Delaware registered series um, that, that's, that we talk about here. But a lot of the questions that, that we hear from clients, why would we go ahead and do a registered series LLC? When we lay everything out for them, they're still paying an annual fee to Delaware. They're still paying a formation cost. Each of the series has to have the same registered agent as the other, so there's going to be a registered agent fee. So really, you're going to save about $225 but yet you've got this brand new unique structure that still has quite a bit of confusion that some of your attorneys don't understand. Some of your accountants that we found just really aren't up on this concept. Still your financial institutions, some of the smaller ones, the ones that aren't as savvy are completely still ba are, are baffled by it. And then the fact that it doesn't have the case history, why would someone want to go ahead and do this structure? You know, Britt, you're right, and I think you could even go further and say that uh, most financial institutions, banks, brokers, are completely unaware of the series LLC. You hand them a series supplement and tell them, you know, there's no certificate of good standing, there's no formation document, and they just look at you blankly, whether it's an accountant, an auditor, uh, a broker, uh, a bank, um, and like you said, other attorneys. The the vast majority of other attorneys uh, have not dealt with these. By working with these you know, maybe five or six times the series LLC. I have more experience than most with them. Um, now you mentioned that the, the you mentioned not having a good standing, but those are attributes of the protected series. You can't get a good standing for each series. Where the registered series, if you really wanted to, we could obtain a certificate of good standing for each individual series. That's right. We could obtain it for the series as a whole. But I guess the the thought is, I well, I I understand, but. A lot of clients just are just so confused as to why this structure, um, why should they should go with this structure? And we tell them a lot of times, clients usually shy away from this structure just because that it doesn't have the case history, the fact that it is new. But some, 
like the client that you mentioned that you have working in the man marijuana industry, we're really just enamored by the structure and I think it's neat. That's true. I mean, really, to be frank, it's an extremely interesting structure and strangely, it's one that's been much more accepted overseas. Um, there's there's much more of these these cell entities, protected cell entities that 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 are used overseas than here. I think most clients we come to that come to us are very risk averse and understandable. Understandably, I mean, here they're potentially saving a small amount of money, um, taking on a significant amount of potential risk, and that mismatch just doesn't add up in a lot of ways. I think that. Uh, by creating the registered series, definitely the Delaware legislature addressed a lot of the issues that kept the series LLC from uh, from being used, that kept the, its terms ambiguous. But at the same time, by doing so, they removed the very justification for using the series LLC, the cost, the administrative efficiency, the ease of use. Ease of use. Aside from that, I I don't see many situations where it makes a great deal of sense to use the series LLC over uh, a series of separate, uh, perhaps series is the wrong word to use, a succession of separate LLCs. I did have one client recently that really was spot on for this type of structure and he was really excited to use it. He operated different domains and different websites. And this was an easy way to simply have one LLC where each and every domain uh, and website, website that he operated was just one individual registered series with the state of Delaware. So for him, he felt that it worked quite well. There wasn't much liability, but it, for, it really helped to distinguish each and every website for him. So instead of doing DBAs or something along those lines for each yeah. and every website. So it, it, there are some situations that this does work, but for your real estate investors, your 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 entities that are going to be holding large assets, it, it may not work. And there's just a lot of things to consider. Yeah. And I, I do think though that there is potential in the future. You know, a lot of what I, I think we're going to see is more tinkering with the series structure. Clearly Delaware has an interest in, in seeing its popularity grow. I mean, already the LLC form encapsulates what 70% of uh, new yeah. formations, I believe, Brett. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so I, I do believe they're really trying to put emphasis on the series LLC. And there are ways that registered uh, series may come in useful in ways that, um, you know, a, a separate LLC may not. For instance, there's a number of, of circumstances on the horizon where either in terms of federal law or state law, we may be seeing beneficial owner reporting at some level. There are only eight states which currently do not require some form of owner reporting of LLCs and corporations. Um, and federally, there's currently a bill that um, I'm writing my third blog post on called the Corporate Transparency Act, which is almost assured to be passed. Now, it's unclear, at least in the con one context where I'm aware of, um, the members of an LLC would need to be uh, presented, um, but not necessarily those of a series, particularly a registered series. So there are ways it could be useful in the future. I, I like to think that this was a first step um, toward uh, sort of rehabilitating the series LLC from what it was. And I'd like to add on that, you know, I think this really shows as well the ability of the state of Delaware as a whole to stay on top of and stay on the cutting edge of the, the corporate laws, uh, the LLC laws. Um, not only do they have now this registered series LLC that's very unique, they also have the public benefit LLC. So Delaware does listen and it does have its ear close to the ground to see um, what they can do. And when they see something that does need action, they take the yeah. action. And this took quite a bit of time to get it up to speed, get the laws written and um, get it rolling, but they did a great job with it. And I will say they very, they very, um, with quite a deal of, of precision, they targeted the areas that attorneys and, and other service providers were worried about. Um, you know, the, the bankruptcy consequences, the um, UCC securing an interest in a series assets, um, tax uncertainties. Uh, they, they really hammered each of those in a very specific way in creating the registered series. 
Um, and, and so they are really looking, I believe, at the Series LLC. Uh, I would like to go briefly just sort of a, an interesting fact about uh, a series. And what always comes up is how can the series merge or convert? What can the series do? Um, now, a protected series can convert into a registered series of the same LLC. So your protected series can convert to a registered series. This includes protected series that uh, predated uh, August 1st, 2019, when the registered series became an option. Um, and that requires a certificate of conversion and a certificate of registered series, which, of course, Brett and his teams and related teams can certainly help anyone to, uh, to work with. Similarly, a, a registered series can convert into a protected series of the same series or the same LLC. And this requires a certificate of conversion and the cancellation of the former certificate of registered series. Now, unless set out in the LLC agreement or the series supplement for a given registered series, conversion requires the approval of members holding more than 50% of the interests of the relevant series. So Delaware has given you a roadmap on sort of how to um, split and join the series in ways to make the the series LLC the most flexible and the most uh, versatile entity it possibly can be. So it allows you to move the series around, um, to shuffle them. It allows you to merge them such that it's a lot easier than trying to transfer and sell the assets of a series to another. To go ahead and add on that, to go in about it in a different direction, um, some of our clients like to go ahead and form the series LLC. They'll go ahead and file the the register, or they'll file the series LLC, but they won't actually submit any of the actual registered series to Delaware Division of Corporations. Um, so they have a LLC that they can just use as a traditional LLC, but yet it's there for them to go ahead and potentially down the road, if the structure uh, really catches on, they could then go ahead and file the registered series. That's something that, that we've heard um, recently that's really struck a chord and, and have really put some of our clients over the edge where they go ahead and file a series LLC. Yeah, certainly. Brett, to ask you a question on that topic, if somebody does that and intends in the beginning to use it just as a regular LLC, do they still face the same complications with Saints and other third parties? When we final this certificate of formation, it's the birth certificate for an LLC or a series LLC. Really the one difference for the series LLC creation is an extra statement on the certificate of formation that says the LLC has the ability to create the series or class. So it's more or less just one extra article that's filed on the certificate of formation. Where it really came into play in the past and to date is when they're going to use the actual filed individual internal series. That's where the complication comes into play because people just can't quite wrap their head around that concept. Yeah, and that language is, is intended, the language in the certificate of formation is meant to sort of put someone on notice that they're dealing with a series entity. But it really didn't work because people weren't looking for the certificate of formation of the LLC. They were trying to find anything about the the series they were dealing with, perhaps thinking it was a separate entity. Themselves. So when you say it didn't work, what you're referencing is situations in the past before the, the registra registered series came into play. That's right. It really didn't put anyone on notice of the series structure because oftentimes it would be, you know, series one um, boat. 17 that, that you were dealing with and you weren't dealing with the overall name of the overarching uh, LLC. Which the name that you mentioned, Series Boat 1, is just recorded within the LLC agreement. There's nowhere on file with That's the Division right. of Corporations and that is really hits the nail on the head of the issue and the problems that, that we face. That's right. And again, the registered series took care of a number of those and uh, we just have to wait and see whether the, the Series LLC continues to to be tinkered with and catches fire. Cool, so just sort of to summarize, the Series LLC has been around for a little bit, uh, wasn't really catching on for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is the, the 
the lack of awareness from other entities in dealing with them. Um, and now maybe we're headed towards, towards uh, more usefulness and more recognition of them, but we sort of have to see uh, kind of what you were saying, Jared, about the um, Transparency Act that might be coming through and see if that really does spur the series LLC into use out of uh, necessity or just preference based on what it can offer in, in reflection of that. It's a question of whether they leave that as sort of a, a, a gap in the legislation, whether they fill that gap. Um, but either way, that's going to be a, a separate webinar, but a very interesting one where hopefully the series LLC will be mentioned as an option. Before we head on, there's one more last point I wanted to mention that I did miss, is that a series cannot be lifted out of a series LLC. So a series, uh, uh, the series of a series LLC cannot re-domesticate to another jurisdiction on its own. It can't merge with another, with a, with a third party on its own. It has to go with the LLC. It can merge amongst the series um, within the LLC, but it, it can't go out and act on its own with another company in terms of corporate transactions like a merger or relocation. So I think now if there are any, well, the outstanding issues really in many ways that I, what I wrote here are rhetorical. Um, you know, will the amendments make the series LLC more commonly used? I don't see, I see a lot of talk happening. I don't see people running out and forming them right away. That's what we're seeing as well. We're seeing a number of inquiries in regards to the series LLC. And once we talk, and discuss the complications and the issues that others have faced. And that's one thing that we really like to do is our team does try to go above and beyond and, and, and make sure our clients are aware of the hurdles that others have faced. So therefore, they're, they're, if they'd like to go forth and use the structure, they're aware of what could potentially come. You know, and the next question is, when will judicial guidance come down on the nature of the separate series? The fact that this hasn't come down yet surprises me. Uh, I think it's the lack of use of this entity in the past reflects the fact that there's been no case law on it. And the entity's been around since 96, so the structure's been around and there's still no case law. That's right, and there's no case law in other jurisdictions too where we could look to say, okay, you know, just to, to give a random state, um, you know, Texas has a series LLC, and we haven't seen any Texas court decisions that come out and either respect the separateness or don't. So, uh, you know, until we have some sort of judicial testing, a, a kicking the tires of the internal liability shields, we really just don't know how effective the series LLC will be, if at all. What's the next? Yeah, and the next was a question on there um, was was just the point I made before that you know by by structuring the registered series the cost benefit the administrative ease it's all removed than than just using separate entities so it it remains to be seen and perhaps I'll be surprised at how some industry or some group will attach to the series LLC and and find it you know works for their a particular type of asset or particular activity. So I'm uh, I'm still hoping I'll be surprised, but again, like Brett said, I don't see that rocketing growth, uh, simply a lot of interest for now. Here we are over a year later, and it seems like this has really come to a head within the last four months. It seems like we've gotten a big uptick, um, and it's becoming better known to the public. Mm -hmm. um, but yep, there's still so much uncertainty about it. Um, not many of your attorneys are aware, your accountants are aware, your bankers, and uh, we've got a lot of familiarity with it and can help you with, with the questions that you may have. All right, thank you guys. And that that's sort of all we have as, as far as the, the, the slides in the presentation, but we do wanna take your questions and I have a few of them lined up already. So we're gonna get to those. A um, Couple of quick things before we get there. Uh, just a reminder of, of Harvard Business Services and why we might be the right choice for your company formation and registered agent service. We've been around for 40 years. Uh, we offer low prices. We're a family owned and operated company. 
Um, you will find no better customer support than what you get with our team. We're always there to answer your questions and very, very quick with responses. We offer same-day filing services, a very low rate of $50 per year for Delaware Registered Agent Service, if you do have a Delaware company. And you can just feel free to go ahead and check out our customer reviews on Better Business Bureau and on Trustpilot. Uh, we're, we're very proud of those ratings and uh, certainly go ahead and compare us to our competitors as well, and, and you'll see the difference there. Um, a lot of you who are on the webinar today probably uh, found out about it through our uh, emails, through our, our blog subscription. Um, if you are not already on that subscription and would like to be and just sort of get information about uh, happenings in Delaware and, and managing your company and other events like this webinar, um, you, can, you can subscribe right on our website. Uh, in fact, I have yeah right here. Um, if you just go up to HBS blog and then click the subscribe button, you will be signed up. And we do not spam. We don't sell your information. We're just sending you one email a week generally, and uh, it's just the new information that we have published uh, recently. Um, and this slide was just our various contact options. Uh, you can also reach us via WhatsApp now. Um, so any way that you want to reach out to us, you're more than welcome to do so, and our team will be happy to assist you. So let's jump into some of those questions that we have. And if there are people out there who have more questions, please go ahead and, and type them in, and we'll get to as many as we can. We have some time. So guys, I want to I want to start with well, I want to start with turning off the presentation. Apparently, um, one of our one of our uh, attendees asked Jared while you were talking about um, banks not being familiar with the series LLC type. Um, do you know of any banks? Uh, you, you said specifically U.S. or Caribbean that might be able to help with the series LLC. You know, I I found a few regional banks when I was practicing in, in Washington, D.C. It was, uh, you know, there were Eagle Bank, uh, I know, was familiar with uh, with the series, LLC. Um, the majority of banks, the large banks that I was able to sit down with and talk to and explain the idea to, eventually came to get it. They came to make a decision about whether they would take the account or lend. Um, particularly given in the time I was dealing with cannabis companies in, in the series of series LLCs, which which are not favored by banks. But, um, you know, it's hard to give specific names. They, they generally tended to be regional banks, uh, niche boutique banks, but I did not find any that on the whole were sort of series LLC friendly. I think, too, in our experience with the, the, the customer service sales team, a lot of times the the banking is a hurdle, not just with series LLC, but just the bankers understanding the documents they have in front of them. It, it's not just a particular bank. It boils down to the individual bankers as well. So we found that there can be different requirements from a particular bank to bank when dealing with these individual bankers. And some a particular banker may understand the structure while his colleague down the road may not. But no, I don't. I don't know either of a bank that's um, we can tell you say, hey, go talk to these guys. They're series LLC experts. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, information. And from the same attendee, I have another question, and I'm just going to read this one because you'll probably understand it uh, a little better than I do. Uh, what structures exist for a Delaware 501c3 nonprofit religious organization? that owns a Delaware LLC to administer its auxiliary enterprises for realty contractors, et cetera. Into that structure, I'd need to know a little more about just what sort of functions they were trying to perform, whether they were being compensated for any of those functions such that they would have unrelated business taxable income or UBTI. Um, that's a bit of a complex question to, to answer in a vacuum. Uh, Okay, no worries. Okay, no worries. Um, if, if the attendee is still listening and, and wants to elaborate a little, we'll go ahead and type it in and, and we can uh, circle back with Jared on that. Um, somebody else wants to know if there's a requirement to register each subsidiary as a separate LLC or do I trademark each subsidiary name under the series LLC? Um, 
Well, there is an obligation if you're if you're creating a registered series. Um, the, the more the more formalized and the more um, the stronger of the two, you do need to file the certificate of registered series and register uh, the name and the the existence of the series with the state of Delaware. And now, in terms of trademarking, that's much more up to you. Um, trademarking is never a requirement. It's it's a, a very good practice a lot of times. Um, but it, it, deal, it deals totally with the Patent and Trademark Office or maybe state trademarks, although federal are always better. Um, so I, I think you'll, you'll first need to do the name check to make sure that the registered series name is available. You'll need to document it in the filing. And then trademarking is really a separate matter. You'll need to do a trademark knockout search and then probably a comprehensive search and you know, that's about a year to 18 month process. So, so generally speaking, those two things, registering the series LLCs and registering the trademark are not interdependent really. They're just separate items that need to be taken care of at your own request. Right. You could, you could get the okay from Delaware to um, use a name and yet still find that you're violating a trademark um, at, on the federal level. The names are unique. When we check a name with Delaware Division of Corporations, um, we're just check, able to check Delaware's database. We're not able to do a nationwide search to give an all clear on that name. That would be quite an undertaking. Yeah. So there could be a company by that name in every state of the nation. Highly doubtful. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, another question that we have is trying to elaborate on just how recognizable the series LLC is in other places. So um, this person listed a, several different U.S. states and a couple of foreign countries. Uh, rather than trying to address them one by one, what, what's your understanding, Jared, of you know how how likely is it that a given state or a given country will know about the series LLC and be able to help you with it? You know, I would say it varies fairly wildly. Um, uh, there's there's approximately, and I may be off by one or two, 15, maybe 16 states that have a series business entity concept. Um, as I've said, also there are are other there's other countries, particularly those that are uh, considered your sort of offshore jurisdictions, the BVIs, the Caymans. They have segregated portfolio companies. They have a, a number of different cell companies. So it varies quite a bit by country. It's very hard to say sort of overall what's the likelihood. It'll, it'll be a case-by-case -case basis. There are some states that we've encountered. They're definitely aware of the series structure. So for instance, when going to qualify a company within certain jurisdictions, some jurisdictions said in the past, if you had the traditional just registered series where the series are documented internally, they're going to notice on the certificate of formation that it's a series LLC. And they're going to charge you more to qualify in their jurisdiction. Some states are going to ask you how many internal series you have, and then they're going to charge you a fee on each internal series. Series, so the cost savings really goes out the door. So um, states didn't want to lose income um, for clients going and trying to use this structure. They were thinking ahead, thinking it may become more popular, and wanting to charge additional fees per series. So they were definitely aware, but it still doesn't history, the case history. So if somebody wanted to find out um, more about, you know, specifics where the series LC might be recognized, is that something, well, as far as U.S. states, would that be like Department of State, or are they better off speaking with an attorney to try to find that out? Secretary of State's office, um, if, you, if you were to call. Um, one thing that we found is some of the state employees might not be quite familiar with what you're talking about, like with any bureaucratic agency, but it would be the Division of Corporation Secretary of State's office. Yeah, and I would say if you're if you're seriously considering the series LLC and, and you're considering um, a series, uh, operating through a series, doing business under the name of a series, you know, qualifying in other jurisdictions through the series, um, it may well be worth consulting an attorney in that jurisdiction to see just uh, the level of comfort there, how the state uh, uniform commercial code or UCC uh, handles series or doesn't mention series. Um, 
whether the state generally is, is cognizant or, or, or has previously adopted a series entity. It's such a a very widely varying and bespoke sort of entity that, that getting legal guidance, I believe, is, is quite important. All right, great. Uh, moving on to the next question, we have we have two questions lined up here uh, to go. So if anyone else listening has more questions, please uh, send them in now so we can get to them before we uh, break from this webinar. Uh, the next question is, can an individual series be easily sold? For example, a series that holds a boat as an asset, selling the series and the asset to a new owner. It seems a registered series would better accommodate that scenario. Out of the series. Jared, I'm sorry, I had you muted for a second. Can you start that answer? Oh, sure. Uh, no problem. Uh, you cannot sell a series. You can you can sell the asset out of the series, but you cannot lift out, say, a registered series and sell that series as a compartment with the asset in it. So when it comes to, say, you know, acquisitions, you're stuck with the asset sale route as opposed to, you know, buying the membership interests. So that right there, so it's just an example of another drawback that people would face with the series LLC if it was looking to hold multiple yachts or planes. Now, technically, I, I, I suppose you could buy the membership units from the current investor in the series, hold, continue to hold the asset as a registered series within that series LLC, but then you're sort of inhabiting a hive within somebody else's bee house. You know, it's it's a it's a little strange to be within somebody else's bee house. I don't know, someone <laughs> else's LLC. <laughs> All, right. All right, well, that's a, note a good note bee. on bee houses. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> moving to the next question, uh, could you please elaborate on the example of venture capital funds that? Could use the registered series LLC. Does that mean that every separate investment a VC makes can fall under each different cell? Uh, yes, in the case I worked on, that is how we structured things. It was actually much more complex than that with multiple layers of series LLCs, each series acting as the manager of another series. It was it was very unnecessary. But um, generally, one could simply have a series LLC. Each series is, is made to make a specific investment. Let's say you get four to five people together, pool their money in series 26. You invest in a specific company that's identified for that series. Say another six people, different people invest in series 27 for a single investment. Um, that tended to be how that worked. Of course, when you get into private funds, you have um, a whole lot of federal securities laws uh, considerations which was my past life was structuring funds, uh, hedge and, and venture capital. So there's there's a lot of other considerations in a fund, but that's the basic thought. Interesting, Interesting. all right, thank you. And just to wrap us up here, um, I have a, a, a bit of an elaboration on that earlier question about the 501c3. So I'll, I'll read this and if you have any uh, direction you wanna provide, Please feel free. Uh, the 501c3 uh, religious nonprofit intends to own property, contractor, entity, services, LLC, LLCs, LLCs, et cetera, but wants those, those properties and entities to be separate LLCs under the series. There will not be workers or employees in any of the series. Any such workers will be professionals under those external LLCs hired as contractors. Um, some of the branch lodges of the profit have a 501c10 existence and need to have separate operations. So I'm, I'm skipping around a bit, but you sort of get the, the picture. Is there is this still something that's a little too broad to, too specific rather to, to help with? Or? Uh, you know, it, it, it sounds in theory like something that is possible, but I don't know how the tax interplays with it. And I don't know enough about what these entities would be doing to, to speak on a 503 see whether it's you know 501c3 501c10 um, there's just too much at play there for me to really give any sort of concrete answer without taking a little time to sit down with that person and and uh and hash out what needs to be researched further and and you know what lines need to be drawn all right all right that type of situation um i could definitely recommend non-profit attorney um I, I i would highly recommend somebody who's very skilled in 
nonprofit structure because these nonprofits, particularly the church structures, can get religious structures, can get very complex. There can be umbrella structures. Um, you have all sorts of investing of endowment issues. You've got owning real estate has issues, unrelated taxable income. It's just taxation is a mess, and I prefer not to swim in that messy pool. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. All right. all right. Well, thank you both. And uh, that will wrap up our questions and our webinar today. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us. And hopefully we would uh, we were able to answer any questions that you had. Um, Jared and Brett's contact information is on the screen there. So if you do have any lingering questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, let them know. And uh, like I said, we'll, we'll be happy to assist you with that. So thanks again for joining us today. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.